deadly wound. We'll read more about it. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and commit fornication. What, what happened? Why is God calling attention to old Balaam here? He was a priest, supposed to be. But you know what Balaam was more interested in than anything else? Self-gain. Money. Okay. That's what he really had in mind. You know what happened to him? Um, allow me to go to Joshua chapter 13, verse 22, and read it to you, why God would bring him forth in that scripture. Verse 22, Joshua chapter 13 reads, Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer. You got that? Do you know any soothsayers? I'll, I'll explain that. The soothsayer did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. The deadly wound. That's why he brought it out here. That's why he's carrying the sword. That sword can mean business. I'm talking about the word of God. It is powerful. It is meaningful. And poor old Balaam, a soothsayer is one that says a lot of easy to hear, wonderful things, but they end up evil. Well, who in the world would be doing that today? Well, brethren, you just join our little group and you don't have to study God's word. You're going to fly away, you know. Right in the middle of all the turmoil, you have you rest easy. That's a soothsayer. That's what, and that's what killed Balaam. False teaching, teaching for the wrong reason. God does not send out beggars. As it now, He never will. And that's why Balaam died by the sword. And that's why Jesus in this one church says, "I'm the one." that has the two-edged sword. You can read about it also in first uh, chapter of Revelation, verse 16. Okay. So I'm standing there and I'm right from the sun. I've got the old brightness and I've got that sword. We've got it. I'll, I'll just turn back there and read it for you. Chapter 1, verse 16, and he, and, um, and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. He was bright. He was the light of the world. But he still carries that sword. And that sword of the Lord, even today, is a powerful thing. The truth will expel every lie when you have the knowledge to be able to document from the Word of God what God would have you absorb in your mind whereby you don't find Satan tempting. You know who he is. You don't want any part of him. So naturally you escape the hour of temptation by knowing who he is, where his throne is, and what you're supposed to do about it. Verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You really hated it. You know, almost half of the, over half of the false teachings came from this place where the Nicolaitans at Pergamos taught. And you know what? One of the main things they worshipped, why would God bring them in here? The serpent, the old dragon. It was their symbol. And naturally, anytime you treat, teach people to accept the first Messiah to fly away that comes to this earth, what are you teaching? You're teaching Satan worship, because that's who it is. And that's why that old sword is so very powerful, and that's why God hates that doctrine, false teaching, instead of teaching his word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, in the simplicity in which Christ spoke it. It's powerful. It's meaningful. Verse 16. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them 
with the sword of my mouth. He's going to do what? That sword's coming out. Somebody's going to get a deadly wound. That's what he's, he promises it. It's going to happen. It'll happen to a world uh, government. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. That's the hidden truth. Hidden from who? Hidden from the soothsayers. Hidden from those that will not teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And will give him a white stone, and in the white stone, a, a new name rather written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. There's a beautiful thing about that word stone in the Greek manuscripts. It's the same word in chapter 13 that is to count the number of the beast. The word count means count by wearing, by stones worn smooth over a long period of time. I mean, you know what those stones are. Nobody can fool you. You understand the word of God. And he's given you eyes to see and ears to hear. And you're not for sale. You're going to stand. And I do mean stand for the true Christ. And stand against and allow the Holy Spirit even to speak through you against the fake. Now, is it not strange that out of seven churches, there's only one he speaks of the sword. And it's that old two-edged sword and brings out Balaam who was beheaded, deadly wound. Well, because he was leading, this goes direct. It hadn't happened yet. Well, brother, tell me why it hasn't happened yet. Because Satan hadn't set his throne up on earth yet. And this happens on earth. Well, can we get a little clue? Well, do you think God would leave you wanting? He loves you. He's not going to leave you wanting. All in the world you've got to do is go to Revelation chapter 16. Isn't that simple? All you've got to do is go to Revelation chapter 16 and find out. I'm going to, we covered the fourth seal and the fourth vial two years ago. I'm going to start by touching on it in verse 7 of chapter 16, the great book of Revelation. Listen carefully. I heard another out of the altar say, and another angel, of course, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgment. Eight. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. That is the one act in the vials that didn't happen in Egypt. Okay? This is new. Didn't happen there. And it's coming from the Son of Sons, the Lord God Almighty. But now let's get to, we came here for the fifth. Pay close attention. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. They just won't do it. Okay, here's why we came here. Listen carefully. And the fifth angel, we're 42 years into this, my friends, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Now, wait a minute. What did, I, what did I just tell you about this word seat? It's thronos. It's throne. It's important that you differentiate that. He poured it out directly on the throne of Satan. Okay. On the, the throne, rather, of the beast. And his kingdom, that's where he poured it, was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. Verse 11, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Just wouldn't do it. Which beast do you think he's talking about here? It's important. You'll know if you'll think a moment what seal, what vial, five. Well, pray tell me, you know when the false Christ appears at what vial? Six. We're already pouring it out here in the fifth. So which beast is it being poured out on his throne? Naturally, it's the governmental throne. Okay, The governmental beast. That is where the deadly wound takes place. 
That's why it's poured out on him. I'm going to say this one more time because it's important. The reason you know that this is the governmental beast seat throne is because the false one doesn't come until the sixth vial. Okay. Hadn't happened yet. You've got to keep up with the times. You've got to figure the stages. You've got to understand the stages. And this helps you differentiate that stage. This is the one world governmental system coming from swarms demanding liberty and peace. Somebody receives a deadly wound. We're going to find out who it is. It's important. So where, where can we follow this throne up? Well, you're all familiar with chapter 13. Let's go there of Revelation. Chapter 13, the great book of Revelation. This is not going to be all that long a lecture. So you listen, I want you to be really sharp and not give out on me to absorb knowledge, okay? Not going to be all that long, so really take it in. Chapter 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And um, we'll, we're going to go to another chapter here in a moment, and I'll, inter I'll, I'll identify these people, who they are and what they're doing. Because one of them gets a deadly wound. We're going to read of it here in just a second. Verse 2. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard. That's one that cha changes spots. That's your Kenites. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. That'll take in Rush. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion. His tearing and the dragon, who? Satan himself, the old dragon, gave him his power and his seat. What again does this word seat mean? Throne. The dragon himself gives the one world government its throne. That means its power. You might wonder, you know, many people would say, well, how could all these nations uh, uh, from Tahiti, from Bahrain to Egypt, uh, Syria, Jordan, uh, Yemen, how could all of them at the same time rise up? They got something in common, my friend. And we're talking about somebody that's going to give it a, th a throne. Not just a seat, a throne. What happens then? Verse 3, And I saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Uh, who healed that wound? Well, read the next verse. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? The one world government, you can't make war with that. Why? There's no government to go against it. It consumes the world, but not God's elect. This is where you've got to understand, and this is why you've got to have strong faith, is to know as long as God is with you, who can be against you? Nobody. As long as you are armed with the sword of the Lord, the truth, and you understand what's happening in the world, God protects you. You and he make a majority. And you can count on that. You can believe it. Uh, it, it just so happens that this pastor has been put in a place in life where there were very few of us and hundreds of thousands of enemy. How in the world could we have come out of an ice frozen mess as champions? It's real simple with God's help. I'm talking about the Chosan Reservoir. I was there. It wasn't a pretty place, but we came out and um, lost a lot more of them than there was of us. Okay. Because why? Because God is with us. But here we have that deadly wound delivered, and presto, the supernatural appears on the scene because the dragon is supernatural. You want to remember that. He's got powers, and he can make things work. God allows it, 
but you don't have to be afraid of it. Five, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, uh, and power was given him to continue forty and two months. Satan's prophecies are always in darkness or months. Your prophecies are always given in days, which means solar, sunlight, out in the light, whether it's night or day. You're in the light always. Why? Because the light of the world is with you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Eight, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Your name there? If you love him, if you know the truth, it is. Because you're one of God's elect. Or you're a king and queen of the ethnos. You got work to do. And God knows he can count on you. Champions of the people. He, he can't harm you. Do you remember in the lecture this morning, the orders at chapter 9, verse 4, you go down, but you cannot touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. Why? We're too smart for it. We don't find him attractive. We find him to be an abomination and an affront to Almighty God. So naturally, God's going to protect you. He always has. He always will. You can count on it. But, but get hold of that. How many are going to follow after this farce and worship it? Everybody that isn't written in the book. How many do you know that are written in the book? How many do you know that you can say, Hey, brother, did you know the false Christ coming first? The what? Yeah. The what? Then you know why they're going to worship him. He looks like the Lord, 12th demon. He's um, any name you want to call him that is the savior of that particular group. And he'll fill that role. Not ours. Because our savior has the two-edged sword. It's called the word of God. And the word of God in our mind protects us from nonsense. Verse 9, if any man have an ear, let him hear. You listen to God's word. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity, and he that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience of the, and faith of the saints. Uh, that means, what is the sword of the Lord? It's the word of God. So what's the opposite of it? The word of Satan is lies that will lead people into captivity. But you are one that goes into captivity of the truth of God's Word. And nobody can shake you from that. You're going to hang on to that truth. You're going to follow it. You're going to live it. You're going to fulfill it. And God loves you for it. What happens in the next verse? And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon, naturally. Looks like the lamb slain. But it's the old dragon himself. It's Satan in the role of false prophet, antichrist, 12th demon. <clears throat> maybe, that's a, maybe I shouldn't say that, but it could if somebody wanted to be deceived. He's here. He's going to be here. But that does not affect you because you know how to count the stones over a long period of time that identify him. You know, what helps probably more than anything is to find out who receives the deadly wound. Well, brother, where do we find that out? It's real simple. It's in the 17th chapter. 17th chapter of this great book of Revelation. 17th chapter, verse 1. Let's identify those seven kings. It's important. Verse 17, chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, talked with, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, 
I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. That's old sister Babylon. Do you understand what's said there? God said, I'm, I'm going to show you the mystery of this. No big deal. I'm going to, I, I want to make it simple for you. I'm going to show it to you. When God interprets something, don't you try to interpret. You listen to him. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth... That's an important fact. You want to mark it, underline it. Not the kings that come down with the Antichrist, who are fallen angels, but kings right here on earth that you're going to know. Kings of the earth which committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Not some far off distant thing. People right here on good old terra firma, good old earth. Okay. Nothing supernatural about that. They're just fooled. I could say they're fooled because they are fools, but I'll be gracious, okay? I won't say that. They're misled. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And that's what he was talking about, okay, back in 13. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Oh, that is royalty, looking good. And old sister Babylon does. Babel means confusion. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, of common sense and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, idolatry, not worshiping Almighty God, the creator of all things, but worshiping the imposter. That's why she was babbling, and that's why she dealt in Babel. Five, and upon her forehead, was uh, the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And so it is. False teaching brings Babel, not common sense, which brings truth and peace, peace of mind. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. What? They'll romp on you, call you names, say you don't know what you're talking about. Saints being set aside ones, God's elect. And with the blood of the mortars of Jesus, and when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. It's awesome to see how dumb some people could be to worship this old harlot. Seven. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost, dost thou marvel? What, what are you marveling about? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns, he's going to tell you. He's going to give you the lowdown. All you've got to do is listen. And you're going to know who those seven are. Hey, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. He was in the first earth age. He's not right now because he's locked up. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. There's only one that's already been promised to perish, and that's Satan himself. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, documentation. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is. You're not going to be concerned about it because you know who it is. You don't have any problem with it. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. Can you hang on to this? Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. That means nations on which the woman sitteth. There are seven nations that really snow. Ten. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Do you know how many times we've been told who this is? You go back to Daniel. We're not going there. Just let me talk you through it. Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he sees a huge thing. It's got a golden head. And um, it's got um, 
uh, silver uh, chest and arms. It's got a brass tummy. It's got iron legs, but its toes are made out of iron mixed with clay. That doesn't jail. It's brittle. And a natural stone, not hewn by hands, came along and struck those toes. And the whole thing disintegrated. It crumbled. What does that represent? Well, Daniel went ahead and told you, he said, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are that head of gold. So that's the first one. The first king is Babylon. The second king is Medo-Persia. The third king was Greece. The fourth king was Rome. The fifth is Mohammedans or Arabians, which took over in 630 something, the very rock, the dome itself, and control it even to this day. That king is still in control. And that is the place to which Satan shall return. It's right on that rock, the rock from which Christ ascended, and uh, which is controlled still by the Gentile, as it is written in the great book of Luke, chapter 21. But then, if that's the fifth one, uh, who is the sixth one? Well, we pretty well know who it is. It's the one world government system. It's the first governmental beast. Well, then who is the seventh? Well, the seventh, naturally, is the false Christ. Let's read on, and those will fall into place for you. And we pick that up then with, um, um, with verse 11, And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Well, when is he the eighth? When he's released out of the abyss at the end of the millennium. That'll be the eighth. Guess where he's going? You know that too. And is of the seven and goeth into perdition. He's already been told, you're going to die. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power of kings one hour with the beast. You see, they're not kings of the earth. They're kings that the false prophet will bring with him. These ten now, okay? They're not of the seven kings of the earth. Now, I want you to think a moment. Who's going to receive the deadly wound most likely? Well, who's sitting on the rock? Got it? The one sitting on the rock is going to get moved. The sixth is going to take over. And somebody's going to receive a deadly wound, and seven will come along and presto. It's all made well, and the world is happy, and everybody but those found written in the, in the book of life from the foundation of the world are worshiping him. It's going to be a sight to behold, beloved, and it's coming upon us. It's moving in toward us. There's no mysteries. You see, this chapter is not given to you in parables that you have to figure out. It is God explaining parables. You do not touch that. You do not argue with that. Because that's the way it's going to be. That is the word of God. And you can, you can count on it. You, I mean, you can bank it if you want to. If you, I'll use that old saying. And, uh, because it's going to happen that way. Let's continue. He's going to explain the rest of it. 15. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That Babylonian system rests right on the people of the world. They're going to swallow it hook, line, and sinker. You know, it is amazing to me how that people will go crazy over a um, singer, uh, an actor, a sports figure. I mean, just go bonkers. What do you think they're going to do when somebody shows up that can snap his fingers and lightning come down from heaven? 
They're not geared for that. Okay? You are. Because you are told in that 13th chapter of Revelation that thoughts will come from heaven when he snaps his fingers, that religious beast. It won't be any miracle to you, because you know who he is, you know he's a fraud, you know he's a fake. And the ten horns, who are they? Which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. They're supernatural. They're going to, they're going to be very crude and rough. And um, they disrespect women, period. The ilk that it comes from. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until what? Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. That two-edged sword's going to cut. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The confusion. That's what Babylon is. It's Babel. And again, I'll repeat it. God is not the author of Babel, but of peace, common sense. And absorbing the truth, recognizing it, hanging on to it, brings you peace of mind. You're not going to find it anywhere else in these times. So when you do see that truth, then let that truth make you whole. Whole as a Christian. Whole as one that can know and understand. In closing, I mentioned Daniel chapter 2. Let's go to Daniel chapter 11. And let me say just a word or two, and then I'm going to close. We've absorbed about what we're going to here on this deadly wound. The solicit kingdom and the Ptolemaic kingdom that you read of in Daniel chapter 11, the Seleucid is basically Iran, uh, Iraq, and all of the nations in that particular period. The Ptolemaic is Egypt and those to the south. Same people, Persians and the Egyptians, the Arabians, that kind of clash a little bit against each other. Now, so, I want to pick it up at the 42nd verse, and we're going to complete at 45. That ends this lecture. This is where that king steps forward, and he tells you what he does. 42, he shall stre stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. It hasn't. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Libya now and um, uh, Ethiopia is Tunisia where we had the big action about three weeks ago and it continues. It's happening okay. right before your eyes. Well, how is he gathering the silver and gold? Hey, well, let's see if we can figure this out. How many of you had to gas up coming here? Hmm? And they're kind of gathering it, aren't they? Getting, getting to be big time with it. Yeah, they're gathering it. And that's a sad state because we could do different. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Do you know what troubles him when this point comes? It's you being delivered up and the Holy Spirit speaking through you. It's going to trouble him big time. It'll be worse than the deadly wound. He won't be able to heal this because it is Almighty God speaking through his elect identifying what's happening in this world, you're a part of it. God has chosen you for that. Stay with him. Stand with him. Either stand with God or you stand for nothing. Well, make that stand. Verse 45, to complete this lecture. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace. That, that's the old throne. Where's he going to do that? 
He's going to plant it between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, right on the rock, okay? Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Why? Sword of the Lord. We have the victory. I've read the back of the book, okay? I know, we have the victory. We've got nothing to worry about. Man only fears fear itself if he wants to get entailed in it. But God has chosen a people to instill truth into that they can see and understand the events that are transpiring in this world. That deadly wound will happen to those that are on the rock. How many of you know what the rock is? You know what I'm talking about? That's where the mosque sits, okay? That is where, why the, the mosque, the dome is over the rock. And that's why people go to war over it. You want to start a war in a hurry? Somebody take the rock. Okay. It's the most sacred place to all religions, Christian, uh, Jewish, uh, and uh, Mohammedan of all the world. So naturally, where would you think Satan's going to sit? That's it. Okay planted right there. But that's okay. Guess what's going to happen to that throne? You read it earlier. The sixth vial is going to be poured right on this throne. And there's going to be some squalling and bawling. That's on the one world system. But hey, wait till the sixth comes when we teach that in depth. What a fantastic time to live. You're living in it. Many of the prophets wanted to live today so they could take part in this. You are living today. And you will take part because you know you can identify. Your name is written in the book, the book of life. Not in the book of some church record, not in the book of some shepherd's chapel record, but right in heaven itself right on God's book of life. And he intends to use you. The deadly wound will happen to that one that stands over the rock because it's the only one left. The rest of them are gone. It's the only one left. It's sure not going to happen to the one world government system. So there you have the deadly wound. You have Christ's warning of it way back in Revelation chapter 2. You know... Never forget, you belong to Smyrna and Philadelphia, those, the truths taught in those churches. Not, not Pergamos, not any other. Pergamos means height. They like to say, we're right at the top of the rock. Yeah, I'm afraid it's not going to last long. Well, be that as it may, you know, I'm going to stop there because I was taught a long time ago, when you're through, quit. You know? <laughs> Best thing to do. But I love you. It's important that you have this information and that you use it and let people know and hear. That's what your obligation is. Stay in the sword of the Lord. It's a powerful thing. Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. So you might think about it, but have your proof set. Otherwise, um, uh, who knows, maybe it's better. Uh, she's always claimed to be a Christian. Well, it doesn't seem like she... Uh, not knowing the case, but uh, I could only say that. Uh, and uh, uh, may God be the judge. Uh, Floyd from Alabama. 
I am 75 years of age and have been in and out of scores of churches for over the last 70 years without learning anything about the Bible. In September of 2010, I found you on TV and thank God every day for you and your teaching. I study I to 50 to so today I am thanking you and your staff. Uh, well, thank you. We appreciate that. God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, is the way to go. My question, how long should I, uh, should I watch seeing I feel guilty if I don't watch all day, five days a week? Well, there are some stations we're on for 15, 13, 14, 15 hours, so that's... It's according to your appetite. You do certainly don't have to watch every minute, and, and uh, you'll be in good standing. Father knows what we're capable of, and as I stated, everybody's got a different appetite. And when, when you cease retaining it, then don't, don't make it boring to yourself, but enjoy what you do. B good to have you with us. Bill from North Carolina. Simplify. I'm a 20-year Marine and have enjoyed learn hearing the word for many years now. Thank you. Well, simplify right back. My question may be a simple one, and I wonder if there is a deeper meaning to it. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Well, there is kind of a deeper meaning. The first were chosen, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, before the foundations of this earth age. They were chosen first because they stood against Satan at the rebellion. But they are in the last generation now because they are God's elect that will stand against Satan again. Why? God knows he can trust them. Good old Simplify, always faithful. He knows they're going to be there, that he can count on them, and so it is. The first were chosen first, but they live in the last generation of this earth age, the generation of the fig tree. Um, Dr. Arnold Murray, for this is Nathan, six years old from uh, Georgia, I believe it is. My, my question is, a lot of things are going wrong. What do I do? Should I follow my heart and trust God? I, I know at six years old, things can sure mess up sometimes, and it can seem like a bad day with things going wrong. Just take a deep breath and know that your parents usually have everything pretty well best in mind for you because they want you to grow up to be a strong, intelligent, sharp young man. And you're going to be already because you're going to um, trust God. And so you, you just, uh, you know what is right intuitively. So always do what's right. Thanks for, thanks for letting me uh, share, this, for sharing that with me. Uh, Michael from North Carolina. Blessings from our Lord, thank you. We can always use that. My question is, when Satan comes to this earth in an attempt to trick God's people, might he use God's own word in a twisted interpretation to attempt to trick people to volunteer to join his forces? Of course he will. You know, this is the only reason Christ went into the wilderness for a time of temptation, to show us how to do it. You can read of it in Matthew chapter 4. What did Satan use to tempt Christ? He used Scripture. Satan is more familiar with God's Word than a lot of Christians are. And when you read Matthew chapter 4, you can realize that. There's just one problem. When you check out the Scripture he used, he always did his little tweaking and twisted it about 90 degrees right at the end, which made it false. And uh, I wonder how many Christians can catch that to really know it. So, yeah, he will use Scripture. He's coming as Christ. That's why they call him instead of Christ or Antichrist. Um, Corinthia from Arizona. Um, and, and this is from, uh, you put your, no, not your age, uh, but from a child. Why did God destroy the dinosaurs in the first earth age? Well, uh, Cynthia, it's, it's real simple. He had to destroy the whole earth age because Satan had really messed it up. A third of God's children had followed Satan 
as it is written in Revelation chapter 12. And God had a choice. He could destroy a third of his children, which he didn't want to do, or he could destroy that whole earth age and give each of us born innocent a babe from our mother's womb to decide whether we would follow God or Satan. That's why he did it. And uh, God loves his animals, and he gave us animals again, and he will give us animals even in the eternity. Thank, thank you for asking. Uh, Chip from Tennessee, I notice you acknowledge a metal flying machine in Ezekiel. Why would an all-powerful universe creator need a machine to put, to, to put around in? Because he had his altar with him. The altar of God was right there with him. And, and, um, and naturally, um, that uh, mode of transportation, it'll be used again. And uh, I think Ezekiel did an outstanding job of, of explaining it. It wasn't that he only needed it. He had a whole, uh, he had a whole group of people with him. And they needed it too. J.E. From, from West Virginia. I have two questions. Can I, can I be baptized by someone who believes in the rapture theory? Uh, that would be a, simply a private choice of yours. It has to, the person that does the baptizing has nothing to do with it really, as, as long as they're Christian, it should be a Christian. But it's between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that you are publicly saying, I know that he went into the tomb that's under the water, and that he arose, that he came out of the water as you would, and, and that you make that public knowing he lives and I live in him. And so that's, that, that would be a choice of yours. It would be, and, and where in the Bible can I find verses regarding those who need help in the spirit world? I think what you're talking about is the millennium, when one that has taken part in the first resurrection in the book of Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end, it all has to do with the millennium age when we're all in spiritual bodies. And if you have a mother, brother, sister, father, or so forth, a relative that, you, that needs your help, if you are one of God's elect, you can go help them. And you'll find that in Ezekiel chapter 44, beginning with verse 20 through about 25. Tina from Georgia. I have, I have been, um, I've been saved in a church, but I have talked to our Lord Jesus Christ and told him that I do accept him as my Lord. I have not been to church. I'm sorry. I have not been to saved in a church, but I have talked to our Lord Jesus Christ and told him that I do accept him as my Lord and Savior. And I asked him if he would come into my life and save me. I asked if he would lead me, direct me, and give me knowledge and wisdom. I feel that he has. Is this acceptable by God? Of course it is. Um, my son is 10 years old. He watches you with me sometimes, and he loves the Lord and talks to him. He also has not been saved in a church. May, may, may I say, when you're listening and studying God's Word with us, we are a church and you're in church, and he's in church, and God loves both of you. You're not doing wrong by telling him that. You're, you're, you're doing just fine. And um, uh, keep him in the word, and he will not depart from it this, for a long period of time anyway. Sherry from Pennsylvania. I've been divorced twice and married three times. I know now that this is not right with God. I just wasn't happy, nor did I know what I wanted. I realize now that others cannot make me happy and that through the Lord and my faith that that is what life is about and to enjoy what the Lord provides. My daughter studies the Bible and she told me that because of my divorces and marriage that the Bible says I will not be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. I replied that Jesus died to forgive our sins, and through his grace I will be forgiven. I also said that David sinned, but Jesus forgave him. You, you are absolutely correct. 
What, what did, uh, when Jesus was walking, he, he um, went to a well one day. It was the well of Jacob, the, the one we're studying about today. And there was a woman there at that well. And she wasn't even an Israelite. And she drew water and he told her, he said, if you'll give me uh, the living water, uh, I will give you water that you'll never have to thirst again. And he was talking about Christ being the living water. And she pretty soon perceived that um, he was um, of God. And he asked her, he said, where, where is your um, husband? And she said, I don't have one. He said, you're speaking rightfully because you've divorced four or five and you're not even married to the old boy you're living with. And then Christ used her to convert a whole city. Blessed her. You see, uh, I would uh, anyone that tries to tell you that divorce is the unpardonable sin is ignorant of God's word. Absolutely ignorant. The unpardonable sin has nothing to do with adultery or divorce. That is not to say that it's pleasant or that it's not a sin. But praise God, he died on the cross that when you repent, even if it was your fault, to give you a clean new start he, and mean it, and you can't con him, you got to mean it, he's going to forgive you and naturally you can walk right into heaven because he rent the veil from the Holy of Holies. You, you not only go to heaven, you can walk right into the Holy of Holies and, and, and show your love for him. Melinda from California. Could a mamzar be one of the elect? A mamzar can be a king and a queen of their own people, which is a elect, absolutely. Whomsoever will love the Lord Jesus Christ has the hand of God upon them and is a leader of their people. Uh, Dee Dee from South Carolina. I was raised in church and on the Bible, but I did not really understand and was biblically ignorant. I have backslid very badly, and I just want to know if I can ever be forgiven. Of course you can. And we've been speaking about it here. That's why Christ died on the cross. He was perfect. But he died so that uh, by going under his blood, that is to say, asking him for forgiveness, he can erase it. You see, he controls the book of life. That's where your real church letter is at. It's in heaven. And he controls it. It's what's written there about you. And when you truly repent and ask his forgiveness, he erases those sins right out of the book of life, right by your name. And he doesn't want to hear about it again. It's Why? Because it's gone. And if you bring it back up again, you're kind of questioning him as to whether he's able. He is, trust me. When he forgives you, that's it. It's over. Don't ever bring it up again. Don't forget, because that is your way of causing it not to ever happen again. But you are forgiven. Richard from Oregon. In Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. What does us and our man mean? Well, where, where did you come from? Well, I came from God. Well, he was talking about you. You're made just to look just about like you did then, and so it was that uh, it, it, the word is Elohim in the Hebrew, and it means God and his children. Okay, it's, uh, it's all of us, and that's the way we look, that's the way we are, and I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Most of all, God loves you for that. It's his letter sent to you personally, makes his day, and when you make his, he's going to make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Or a computer. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, 
you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. book of St. John. What a fantastic book we have here in tape for you, for your convenience of studying as you drive or whatever the case might be in the comforts of your own home. St. John, the writer of Revelation as well as this great book of St. John. John taught in a way that he not only interpreted, translated the word, and, and interpreted, fully translated the names as well as other things that made this word, this book, so easy to understand, helping the very reader see Christ in his work as God, Savior of the world. This book of John giving you the identity of the Kenites, as well as those events that would transpire in the end generation. That's your generation, beloved. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, bless your hearts. Uh, good day to you. Arnold Murray here at the Shepherd's Chapel. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. What's the subject? Tongues. You'll remember in the last lecture, we discovered that the tongue on Pentecost, the miracle of the presence of the Holy Spirit, wasn't that it was unknown or un not understandable, but just the opposite, that it, you heard it in the dialect in which you were born. That is to say, your natural language that you grew up with.